the opportunity is to take a huge waste stream of the largest public school system in the country and transform it into assets. Global Green is bringing together design students, Department of Education, and manufacturers who make resins, polymers, and fibers. Together, we're exploring the redesign of the school lunch tray. The main design challenge that we're facing really has to do with the extraordinarily tight constraints of this project. First of all, a school lunch tray uh, is a very mundane and basic object to begin with. It doesn't allow for a lot of major bold innovations, so innovations have to be very small and very subtle. The National School Breakfast and Lunch Program is mandated and managed by the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, is the one that manages all the guidelines for the school district. Every five years, Congress decides we're going to allow for federal money to pay for the National Breakfast and Lunch Program. When you look at the meal, it's important to understand the meal component that the federal government requires us to serve at lunch. So at lunch, you have to have a meat or meat alternate. Then you have your grains category. Then we have the fruit component. I think you know fruit is right. I mentioned one before, you have your milk component. It's actually a separate component. And vegetables, right, our favorite <laughs> in the school meals program. So you have to offer a red and orange colored vegetable once a week. And you have to offer a starchy vegetable once a week. And you have to offer a dark green vegetable once a week. And you have to offer an other vegetable once a week. And the other really is vegetables that don't fall into any of those other categories. We offer all five of those components. The student only has to take three. But of those three, one of them has to be a fruit or a vegetable. Yeah, it's all about palletizing. Because, I mean, if you think about it, if we're going through 850,000 trains a day in 1,200 locations, it's, it's got to be shippable <laughs> and stackable and storable and, and all that good stuff. What I'm picturing is these big, humongous pallets of styrofoam trays that we have on our warehouse now that I walk by every single day when I will go into the building that are the pallets and they're stacked up five foot high and then they're stacked on top of each other. And you just walk by this big, humongous wall of styrofoam trays and their bags on pallets. The challenges are going to be to find a material that is, first of all, number one, an environmentally sensible material. That means it's either bio-based, biodegradable, compostable, recyclable, reusable. Those are terms we usually think of as environmentally sensible um, definitions. Uh, second of all, we need to find a product that is as cost-effective as polystyrene. It is a very inexpensive material to use, and very few of the environmentally sensible materials are going to be as cost-effective. Thirdly, we need to find materials that will exhibit or can be designed such they exhibit the strength of a polystyrene material. There is very, very rigid material, so it provides a lot of strength with very little weight. So that's a pretty critical element also. And then, of course, just the formability of materials. Many of the readily available materials that fit the earlier definition of sustainable are not as formable. They have certain design um, limitations and constraints that you wouldn't find with a, a polystyrene type material. So those are, those are the factors I think will play into the design. So some of the material challenges involved with this, at least from my perspective, dealing with paper or cellulosic products, is paper's inherent ability to absorb and retain water. So we got over those hurdles with some of the knowledge that we've gleaned from the wax replacement products, green coat is what we market it as, and we've brought that technology over into the molded products and what will eventually be school lunch trays. Global Green has connected us with a number of different packaging manufacturers. And one of these packaging manufacturers is connected to BASF, which is the, the world's largest chemical company. BASF is very interested in getting involved uh, in this project. So they've donated some material to us, and 
and we just got off an hour-long Skype conference with a representative, an engineer from BASF, who can tell us how to use this material, what it likes to do, and what it doesn't like to do. And now the students are equipped with information. Here's how you make a die. Here's what you need in order to form the material. This is what the material likes to do, doesn't like to do. And now they're going to start working on a few weeks of experimentation. So we made, for example, like 40 different material experiments, and that sort of led us to to how we decided what we need to do for our design to make it work. It was kind of interesting to be able to start like big with a bunch of ideas and throw stuff around, but then to be really realistic and see, okay, these are the requirements, how are we going to fit them, and still be able to make something that is fun and different and innovative. What's been wonderful and very helpful about working with Global Green is that they've been able to make connections with manufacturers and schools that would otherwise be very difficult for us to do. So we've been able to visit two schools already in only five weeks of class, um, which if I were as the faculty member to tr try to go down the road of, of, of establishing a relationship with the school would take a very long time. Um, I think actually going to the schools and interacting and talking to the children helped us a lot to understand what they think of the trade since they are actually our clients. Also the different facilities that we uh, visited, for example, at Staten Island, the paper factory, we, we just got a good insight to how things could be produced and how they are produced. So we asked them when we were starting to develop this, them being Global Green, what their interest was in, in this and it turns out that they had been working on a school lunch tray, although we're not working on that specific structure, uh, they've been working on it for a while. After working in individual groups, the teams collaborated on a single class-wide design. It will allow students to develop a healthier relationship with food and it will educate them about the composting and recycling system beyond their own cafeteria. Around the tray design, ergonomic thumb rest locations, balanced weight, nutritional portion sizes, again, something we all agreed on, uh, non stick coating, and icons to help identify teaching students. So, if food goes into composting, non stick coating helps with that. If the tray isn't damaged, it can be recycled, and if it is damaged, it can go into composting. And very few materials are going into the trash. We also need to take into consideration that we're putting a lot of uh, money and resources in something that ends up being garbage in the landfill. Instead of focusing our money and resources on the kids and on their health. You're on the cusp of something really exciting that, you know, whether it's us or any other school system, this is a real life project that could end up turning into something very real. As we make a change, it's only going to be a first step. It's going to need to have more behind it. And, um, and if the city and everything else all comes together like the perfect storm that we think is going to happen, it's just going to be amazing in just a couple of years where we can start going. Certainly, economy is a very critical part of sustainability. I mean, sustainable also means it's cost effective such that you can sustain a program. So that's a big part of sustainability. Over the long term, I think, it will be the only option, so there will be less of an incentive to take the cheap, low sustainability or no sustainable way out. In general, the economy versus sustainability is we can't afford not to do something. So, and the sooner we start, the, the sooner we'll be able to start seeing the economy. Um, we'll have infrastructures in place to, to support and help accept these materials that are being developed and created. So I think the economy will improve as, as more people become engaged. There is a relationship between sustainability and design. I don't think that they can be extracted from each other, nor should they be. I think that moving forward, all design has to start from the standpoint of how sustainable is the solution. How does it address issues of sustainability? And, and that's a very complex uh, question to get into because sustainability is not just about you know, the atmosphere. It's not just about social justice. It's about a multi-layered relationship of, of issues that we have to sort through, but they have to be sorted through with every design solution.